Thank you, sir. Sir, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak on the motion of thanks on the President's address. Sir, I rise to speak on what I hope to be the last ever address of the Honorable President scripted by this Modi Shah regime, a regime which mistakes arrogance for intellect. I am saying this because arrogance, sir, diminishes wisdom and ultimately becomes the camouflage of insecurity in which not only the Prime Minister and his cabinet but also the entire BJP seems to be passing through. Sir, after losing successive by-elections and the recently concluded state elections, the interim budget has shown this regime's desperation to calm the farmers, the middle class, traders, MSMEs, informal sector and real, sector, real estate sector who have been badly affected by the twin shocks of demonetization and the poorly structured and poorly implemented GST, as well as by the rise in unemployment to a 40-year high. But instead of making long-lasting structural changes which would lead to their sustainable long-term performance, in other words, performing life-saving surgery, the Modi Shah regime has merely handed out band-aids, sir. And hence, I name this sham of a budget the Band-Aid Budget, an illegitimate budget for which this regime has no accountability to deliver on. Sir, I would like to share a saying with my fellow Indians and fellow MPs. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. The Modi regime's record of fulfilling their 2014 poll promises is there for everyone to see. They not only fooled me, but they also fooled the entire state of Andhra Pradesh with the promise of giving special category status for 10 years. Indeed, they fooled a lot of people who place their hopes on their words and promises. This 2019 Band-Aid budget is another set of promises for which they have absolutely no accountability, sir. I do not believe they intend to keep their promises. I will not be fooled twice. My fellow Indians, will you be fooled twice? No. Sir, Sri Nara Chandrabab Naidgaru and the TDP walked out of the NDA and the government following being totally ignored in the budget 2018-19. If the Modi regime was able to ignore us while we were partners, we are not naive enough to expect them to suddenly decide to honor their promises and to deliver on our rights. The 29 items contained in the AP Reorganization Act as well as the assurances given by then Prime Minister Sri Manmohan Singh. Most importantly, granting AP special category status with all the benefits of other special category status states. <coughs> Mr. Prime Minister, in case you have forgotten, let me remind you once again that in Guntur, Nellur and in front of Lord Balaji in Tirupati, you promised to build us a capital bigger and better than Delhi. You promised that if NDA comes to power, you will give Andhra Pradesh a special category status, not for five years, but for ten years. Sir, I gave a complete account of what is pending to Andhra Pradesh against our rights as given to us by the AP Reorganization Act and the assurances given by then Prime Minister during my one-hour speech opening the no-confidence motion during the last monsoon session. Mr. Prime Minister, not only have you betrayed the people of AP, but you didn't bother to respond to a single question that I posed during the no-confidence motion. Instead, despite assurances you gave us to calm us down during your speech, you chose to stick to your pre-written text, completely ignoring Andhra Pradesh once again. Mr. Prime Minister, I can imagine you thinking that your stakes in AP are anyway low, as the BJP vote share is hardly measurable in Andhra Pradesh. Also, you may be thinking that 25 MPs from AP are hardly just about 5% of the Lok Sabha. But you have underestimated Sri Nara Chandrababu Naidgaru. He has seen many leaders and governments come and go during his 40-year political career. 
He has been a key player in many of the national formations, including the National Front, the United Front 1 and 2, the NDA 1, until recently was part of the NDA 2. You have under underestimated his credibility across the political spectrum and the ripples that it would create across the country among the entire opposition. You underestimated the power of Indian democracy. You didn't realize that even a state with just 5% of the population and just 5% of the Lok Sabha seats can catalyze a national response to your autocratic ways. The fight for AP's rights has grown into a fight to save democracy. As a united opposition, we have been able to expose how this Modi Shah regime is making a new India, as mentioned by the President in his address, a new India indeed, but a new India in your own image, an autocratic, divisive, invasive, suppressive, coercive, vindictive, Machiavellian, fascist regime. Sir, there are claims and counterclaims between the government of AP, the government of India, the BJP and the TDP. So to clear the air, I demand that the government of India should immediately release a white paper on what it has done with regard to implementation of AP Reorganization Act and assurances given by then Prime Minister Sri Manmohan Singh Ji in the Rajya Sabha. Sir, there have been dharnas, rastadokos, chakka jams, rallies and many more by farmers in Delhi, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Madhya Pradesh and many other states for the last four years. The Modi Shah regime did not care. The BJP bit the dust in every by-election and also the recently concluded state elections. Now instead of waving off their loans, the government in the budget announced that it would give 17 rupees a day. Sir, how does 6,000 rupees a year help a farmer who is in a debt trap? It's only a band-aid for a farmer who is on life support, sir. Will it help even one farmer who is in debt trap and contemplating suicide, sir? Sir, furthermore, they have given 4 lakh crore write-offs for economic offenders and fugitives, but could not show the same large heart to give 1 lakh crore to bring farmers out of farmers' distress. This clearly shows towards whom this regime is tilting. Sir, our CM, Srinara Chandrababu Naidgaru, has doubled farmers' income in Andhra Pradesh in the last four years. The agriculture growth rate is 11%, sir, against a national average of just 2%. If one looks at the pace of present agricultural growth in the country, which is around 2%, and if you add inflation to that, it will take nearly half a century, sir, not by 2022, to double the farmers' income in India. One of the key aspects which helps in doubling the farmer's income is the recommendation of Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, which says that the farmer should be given A2 component, which is paid out costs such as seed, fertilizer, manure, machine labor, interest on working capital, rent paid for land, plus FL component, which is the family labor, and also the C2 component, which includes the imputed rental value of owned land and interest on capital. But sir, this government has given just A2 and FL. If you give the C2 component, the farmer will give, get an MSP as high as 95% more than the present MSP, thereby doubling their income, sir. But instead of giving farmers the C2 component, which will make them sustainable, you have given them just 6,000 rupees a year or 17 rupees a day which is absolutely meaningless for a farmer who is contemplating suicide, sir. Sir, the PM boasted that he would create two crore jobs or ten crore jobs in five years. Two crore jobs a year or ten crore jobs in five years. We are now in the fifth year, sir. Leave alone creating ten crore jobs in five years. Crores of people have lost their jobs and livelihoods due to demonetization and faulty implementation of GST. There are as many as 5 lakh government jobs lying vacant in various departments of the government of India. Sir, the NSSO's latest job survey released a few days ago has compared unemployment figures for 1718 with its past surveys since 72-73, sir. The report indicates that the country's unemployment rate stood at a 40-year high of 6.1%. 
Now the Niti Aayog is trying hard to push this report under the carpet because of the upcoming elections and to cover, the, cover up the failure of the Modi Shah regime. Yeah. 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 Sir, I would need a lot more time than what you will allow for me to go deep into the subject of misusing and the weakening of democratic institutions that India has painstakingly built over decades. Many members have already talked about how institutions like the Parliament, the Supreme Court, the Election Commission, the RBI, CVC, Office of the Governor, CBI and ED, to name a few, are being weakened or are being used as weapons to attack opponents. Not to mention the attacks and control of the media by this media, Modi Shah regime. I will refrain from being repetitive here since so many people have already spoken about it, sir. But, sir, I would like to sp speak about cultural nationalism, which is a very important topic today in India. The Modi Shah regime is openly embarking on a path of cultural nationalism and wishes to define a single national identity and culture for India. They are trying to give a very narrow definition of what it means to be an Indian. Sir, India is not just a country. Indi India is not even just a subcontinent. But India is a civilization that is more than 5,000 years old. In order to understand how our civilization evolved, we have to go back even further. We need to start with a little geological history, sir, in order to understand where we came from, how we interacted and mingled with others who showed up, and how we evolved. Being Indian didn't start in 1947, sir, but evolved over more than 5,000 years, not by making everybody the same, but by celebrating our differences and living in harmony, at least most of the time, sir. During the continental drift, the Indian subcontinent separated from Africa, sir, drifted across the Indian Ocean and came crashing into Asia, forming the mighty Himalayas, the Hindu Kush, and surrounding mountain ranges. These mountain ranges acted as a barrier for entry for millions of years. As people learned to cross these barriers, migration into India began. And India became the first melting pot in the world. Sir, there are only three pure races in this world, sir. The Negroid, which are the people of Africa and Aboriginals in other parts of the world. The Caucasoid, who are people mostly of Europe, uh, from Europe and the Mongoloid who are from the Far East and the Oriental areas of the world, sir. Sir, Indians are not a pure race, sir, but a mix of two in some regions and three in other regions. If you mix all the colors of the rainbow, what do you get, sir? You get brown, and that is what we are, a mixed race of brown people, sir. Sir, throughout the ages, large groups of people have come to India, but no group has ever left India en masse. I have never heard of the term Indian refugee, sir. People have never had to flee India due to religious persecution in the history of our civilization, sir. They stayed and they continued to mingle and continued to integrate. Hinduism existed even before the concept of religion existed, sir, with roots tracing back to prehistoric times over 5,000 years ago. It is a fusion or synthesis of various Indian cultures and traditions. The Hindu synthesis started to develop into a formal religion between 500 BC and 300 BC, after the Vedic period, during which time Buddhism and Jainism were also founded. Judaism first came to India around 500 BC, sir. Christianity came in 50 AD. <coughs> Islam came in the early 7th century. Sikhism was founded in India in the late 15th century. This clearly indicates that India has always been prepared to integrate itself with other religions and cultures. Sir, Central Asians, Greeks, Persians, Romans, Arabs, Mongolians, Chinese, Southeast Asians, and later the European sea powers including the British, French, Portuguese and Dutch all came to India, sir. Our language, our arts and literature, our architecture, our food, our fashion, math, science, astronomy, even spirituality, so many areas we have collaborated and mutually benefited with all these cultures, sir. We have been the home for perse persecuted communities like the Jews, Parsis, Muslims and Tibetan Buddhists. Being the most diverse country on earth, we are tolerant to each other's ideas, ideals and faith. 
unless and until some religious or political patriarchic groups intervene to design differences into conflicts. Please, sir, I'll complete in a few minutes. Being Indian, sir, being Indian is not about region, language, religion, caste, being right or being left, being LGBTQ or not, whether you eat beef or you eat pork or you're vegetarian or you're vegan. Sir, being Indian is about having the freedom to be all of those or some or none at your own free will, sir. Being Indian is celebrating our continually evolving diversity and valuing our freedom and rights above all else, sir. Indians, sir, are not about identity, but Indians are about diversity. That is the Indian way, sir. Sir, I would like to paraphrase Martin Niemöller, a German Protestant Christian who spent seven years in a Nazi concentration camp for opposing the religious policies of Adolf Hitler. I've taken the liberty of changing the victims to, to better suit our current context. <coughs> Sir, I inserted Muslims and Christians in place of trade unions and Jews in this statement. Sir, please, Sir, please, Sir, please, Sir. First, they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I'm not a communist. Then they came for the Muslims, and I did not speak out because I was not a Muslim. Then they came for the Christians, and I did not speak out because I'm not a Christian. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me, sir. Sir, polarization strategy is about making people believe that it is not going to happen to them. It will only happen to what they call the real culprits or to their rivals. Hence, let them suffer and be punished is the mindset that they're trying to create. This message is for the majority who may be influenced by these polarization tactics. I strongly feel that today it may be others, but tomorrow it will be you. Yeah. There is also a report that the Director of National Intelligence of the United States saying that there is every possibility of communal violence before the Indian general elections this year. This is a direct indictment on the Modi Shah regime's election strategy of polariza polarization, sir. Sir, just two minutes, I'll finish, sir. Please, please, sir, please, sir. A very important subject, please, sir. Please, sir. I've been waiting three days to speak, sir. Two minutes. Sir, India is the fastest growing internet market in the world. We are the largest internet data users in the world. We are using more data than the U.S. I'm speaking to the speaker, sir. Ah, bully, bully. We are using more data than the U.S. Eight, and China combined, sir. More and more of essential services are moving online. At this stage, it is important for us to understand what are our rights and to what extent the Modi Shah regime is protecting or violating our right to privacy, sir. Sir, even Bill Gates has been saying that there has to be a balance between technological innovation and privacy. How can we use data to gain insights into education or health while still protecting people's privacy, sir? How much technology can we use to improve our lives and to improve the transparency and efficiency in delivery of services by the government? And where is the Lakshman Rekha that Please stops infringing on our privacy? Sir, the Modi Shah regime passed an order on December 20th, 2018, authorizing 10 central government agencies to monitor, intercept, and decrypt any information generated, transmitted, received, or stored in any computer source by any agency without any approval from any authority of the government of India. Sir, earlier the approval of the Joint Secretary was to be taken for any interception or tapping, but it has been done without proper discussion or consensus. Sir, the above order is a clear violation of privacy and is a clear-cut example of the rise of the surveillance state. This is against the nine-judge Supreme Court ruling in the order dated August 2017 uh, in the case between Puttaswamy and Mohammed Union Singh. of India that right to privacy is a seat. fundamental right, sir. So I'm, I'm going, sir, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to the end. I'm going to the conclusion, sir. Going please, to the conclusion. Please. Yes. Sir, before concluding, I only say that there is a thin line. I'm only saying that there is a thin line between confidence and arrogance. And that thin line is humility, sir. The PM is feeling that he's the savior of India and democracy. But with his actions over the last five years, be it relating to AP's rights, demonetization, improper uh, implementation of GST, and so on, the PM is proving to be a destroyer of democracy and not a savior. 
While, while concluding, I would like to quote Sardar Patel, sir. He said, if your goodness is an impediment in your way, let your eyes be red with anger and try to fight injustice with a firm hand. And that is what our Chief Minister Sinara Chandrabha of Naidgaru, the people of AP and entire India will have to fight this, sir. Thank you. Subscribe us and press the bell icon for more interesting updates.